And I'd like to welcome, welcome everyone from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center here in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And my name is John Asana, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Today's webinar is titled, Update on Evaluating the Effectiveness of Seasonally Assisted Migration Through Fish, fish Rescue Programs. And we're excited to have Jonathan Armstrong and Brittany Beebe with us today, who are from Oregon State University. To start things off, uh, please join me in welcoming Abby Lynch, Abby Lynch uh, who's with NISWISC, uh, who will be introducing our speaker today. Abby? Great. Thank you. Um, again, yeah, I'm Abby Lynch. I'm a research fish biologist with the National Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Uh, first, we have Dr. Jonathan B. Armstrong. Uh, Johnny is, has a BA in biology from Lewis and Clark College and a PhD from the University of Washington. He was a Smith Fellow postdoc at the University of Wyoming and has recently joined the faculty at Oregon State University in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Much of Armstrong's research explores how animals cope with seasonal variation and habitat conditions and how human human land use affects their ability to respond to environmental variation. Um, the project that, that uh, Johnny and Brittany are going to be presenting on today um, is, is funded through, um, through this work. Oh, sorry. And Brittany, Brittany A. Beebe is our second speaker, and Brittany is a master's student in, in Armstrong's lab, and she is working on evaluating seasonally assisted fish migration. Um, she has a BS in environmental science and a minor in eco-hydrology from the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, she previously worked as a research assistant in the Aquatic Ecosystems Analysis Laboratory at the University of Nevada, Reno. Great. Thank you both for joining, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. And Johnny, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks so much for having us. Thanks for the intro, and thanks a lot, everybody, for tuning in. And so I'm going to be talking about <coughs> fish rescue today, and I want to um, first just acknowledge our collaborators uh, at WDFW, Kale Bentley and Thomas Burens, our co-PIs on this project, and another collaborator that we get a lot of help with with uh, life cycle modeling is Russ Perry um, at the Cook Lab uh, for USGS. All right, so you know the, the motivation for this project is captured in this picture right here, and it's that you know ecological drought and uh, climate warming are creating scenes like this, where we have streams drying up, and often these streams have threatened or endangered fishes in them, and it puts Managers in a really tough spot because they watch these streams fragment. They often see fish in isolated pools, and they're sort of faced with the decision to do something or to watch those fish die. And it's a really it's a tough spot, and for, especially when there's ESA listed fish, because as anyone who has ever tried to apply for a, a NOAA scientific take permit knows, um, you know we take mortality of ESA listed fish really seriously. So the question is, what should folks do? And one sort of uh, technique that's quietly emerging as a climate adaptation strategy is fish rescue, at which, in which you move fish out of these habitats before they dry up. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, I just wanted to provide a, a quick outline for the talk. So we're going we're gonna to first sort of introduce the history and widespread use of fish rescue, um, and then focus on how it's being applied as a climate change adaptation tool and think about fish rescue in the context of ecological drought and the flow regimes of rivers. And then we're going to focus on a specific fish rescue program which has emerged in the Pacific Northwest. And we are evaluating this program. And so we're going to talk about how we co-developed an approach for evaluating the assumptions and potential costs and benefits of this program. And then we're going to close by int introducing our methods and the science products that we're creating as a part of this project. All right, so um, if, you, if anyone by chance happened to Google fish rescue, you may have come across a very different type of fish rescue. And uh, so when I, when I started looking into fish rescue, you know, I put it into Google, and I found out that there is a type of fish rescue out there that's, I guess, apparently better known than the, the type that we're going to be talking about today 
or if you have an unwanted koi that your grandma got you, you can give it away to a, a fish adoption agency. But today what we're going to be talking about is the second page of Google search items, which is a type of fish rescue that you may know um, as, as to, by what it's also called, which is fish salvage. And in this type of fish rescue, Basically, if there's some sort of um, water withdrawal or stream drying that's anticipated, people will go out and they will capture fish from the habitat that they anticipate will go dry. So they'll capture them and they will move them either to captivity or to a habitat that's not anticipated to go dry. So here's an example of people in an irrigation canal in New Zealand capturing one of these native eels. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is sort of an emerging tool in climate change adaptation. However, um, one of the things I was surprised as I started to, to do more research on it is that it, outside of this field, it's actually sort of a ubiquitous and surprisingly non-controversial uh, technique. Uh, as I just referenced, it occurs globally. It happens throughout the US, New Zealand, the UK, and other areas. And it's actually a really common part of in-stream work, and this means you know construction in rivers or things related to irrigation infrastructure or hydropower. So for example, if you look on examples from Oregon, if you look on the ODOT website, the Department of Transportation, or the City of Portland, you'll find references to fish rescue or fish salvage. And if you start digging around, one of the key things you'll notice is that the methods and the costs associated with this technique are incredibly variable. So it can be everything from a grassroots effort to something with helicopters and consulting firms that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the methods can be really variable, and we'll kind of get into this in more detail. And one of the things that's neat about uh, fish rescue is that it's often a way to engage citizens and stakeholders, and often it is sort of a grassroots effort where uh, often anglers, passionate anglers, go out and try to save fish that would otherwise die. And just here's a couple examples. In New Jersey, folks go out from Muskies uh, Incorporated. Uh, their slogan is home of the muskellunge. And they go out and they save muskies that would otherwise be faced with uh, stream drying. And Trout Unlimited in Canada does fish rescue um, to save fish from water withdrawals. And there hasn't been a lot of research done on fish salvage and fish rescue, but there was one review on the topic of fish stranding and intervention by Nagrodsky and others. And one of the key things that they found is our understanding of fish stranding and our implementation of fish rescue has really been dominated by fish rescue and salvage pertaining to human activities. They found that over 80% of the studies uh, documented were related to human activities, and 60% of those related to hydropower. Um, specifically, when you have um, hydropower operations that do large uh, ramping of flows to meet power demands, this is the sort of thing that can create uh, real serious stranding issues. So much less is known about the role of fish rescue in response to natural stranding and stream drying. And just as a couple examples of of rescue in response to human activities. Uh, some of you might remember the, the Oroville Dam crisis in 2017 when this massive reservoir on the Feather River um, nearly collapsed. Well, while they were repairing the spillway, fish were stranded and had to be rescued. So that's one example. An example here in Oregon where we are um, related to human activity uh, is that every fall, on the Deschutes River below Wikiup Reservoir, the flows on the Deschutes get severely drawn down in order to fill up this reservoir. And as a result, fish can be stranded. And here there's sort of a grassroots effort where people go out and they scoop up these fish. Many of them are uh, trophy brown trout and native red, band, native red band trout, which people are really, you know, people care a lot about. So they go out and they scoop up these fish and move them to areas where they're less likely to become fragmented. And there has been a limited amount of evaluation of fish rescue and salvage efforts. And one of the, um, one of the few sort of formal analyses uh, that we could find, that, um, it, it, it was, 
had a pretty negative evaluation of the economic feasibility of rescue. However, and so that, that Higgins and Bradford suggested that there's about a 10 to 1 cost to benefit ratio of fish rescue. But I think something to keep in mind here is that the results are probably really context dependent. In this case, this is an example from Canada and salvaging fish for hydropower. And here they were accessing remote sites by helicopter, which clearly does not sound cheap. And most of the fish they were rescuing were juveniles that were then released back into the wild. And you can imagine uh, most, especially with like salmonids, most juveniles are going to die anyways. So if you're rescuing a bunch of them, um, you're probably not going to lot of bang on your buck if you're releasing them back into the wild. But you can imagine if you're rescuing adults or rearing those rescued individuals in captivity, and if you're doing it with volunteer effort, that these results could probably change a lot. All right, so uh, now we want to kind of focus uh, the, our, our background to thinking about fish rescue not in the context of, of, um, of you know, uh, in-stream work or, or these very explicitly human activities, but thinking about it in the context of ecological drought and climate change. And so here's an example of, of where we work in southwest Washington and a stream that goes dry in the summer and is, uh, you know, reduced to fragmented pools such as the one pictured at the left. And as background, I want to, I think a key point um, to make is that fish stranding and fragmentation and drying is not something that's unique to arid regions or regions with Mediterranean climates. It's something that is really ubiquitous. Um, for example, I was just in Cordova in Alaska this March, and I saw uh, I saw several dry streams there, even in the you know one of the wettest places that I've ever been in North America. Also, here's a picture below from Southwest Alaska, where I, where I've done a lot of work on juvenile coho salmon, and here even during the wet season, we see a lot of fish get uh, stranded in ephemeral floodplain habitats after floodplains are inundated, so we see fish getting stranded and fragmented there. But what is unique to some more, um, to areas, you know, with certain climates is sort of the extent and severity of this fragmentation and drying. And just to kind of provide some contrasts, here are some climate data for Vancouver, Washington, the area where we work, and for Dillingham, Alaska, um, which is where I worked previously on coho salmon in, in southwest Alaska. And what you can see is, one has a Mediterranean climate where the summers are much drier than the rest of the year and coincide with the warmest part of the year. Whereas in Dillingham, there's less seasonal variation in precipitation, and the warm summer is actually the wet season. And one of the consequences of this is probably that if, if you're a fish and you get fragmented in Alaska, you, know, you just got to wait until the next rain, which isn't going to be very long. Um, but if you're a fish in one of these more Mediterranean climates, and you find yourself, you know, stranded in a fragmented pool, you might have to wait several months. And so the implications for fragmentation and stranding on fish mortality and on the rearing capacity of streams, uh, I think, are much more severe in these more arid uh, or Mediterranean climates. But even within these climates, there's a lot of variation in sort of the timing and the duration of the low flow events and of fragmentation and drying. And I, I provided these two results of, here's just some USGS uh, stage data that I found online. And these are two watersheds, the East Fork Lewis River, which were, is, is our sort of focal system, but also, also the Carmel River, uh, where there's also fish rescue efforts. And I just want to show that um, even within these two systems where there's, you know, pretty severe drying at parts of the year, there's really you know, large differences in sort of the seasonal timing and duration of these drying periods. So there's variation even within a single climate type. So as streams get into these low flow periods, especially streams that are dominated by uh, rainfall, they can start to fragment. And here's uh, a nice sort of depiction of fragmentation by uh, some of Stephanie Carlson's lab's recent work uh, out of UC Berkeley. And you can see here the sort of classic um, uh, wet, 
dry mapping. And you can see it here as the season progresses through the summer. You go from this continuous ribbon of habitat where the pools are shown as black dots to this increasingly fragmented habitat where by the end of the summer, this, this stream is dominated by either isolated pools or entire you know, reaches of dry channels. And here's a picture of, of uh, Brittany Beebe and our fo one of our focal tributaries. And you can see we have the same sort of um, conditions of drying in Washington as, as folks are seeing in California. And here's one of our fragmented pools. And you know, to some degree, much of this stream drying is natural. But I think what a lot of folks, many, probably many folks on the line right now are concerned about is how um, increasing human demands for water and how changing climate could potentially exacerbate stream drying and increase its severity and extent. And um, this is not an issue that's unique to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, for example, just last week in New York Times, there was a feature on the Rio Grande River and how a combination of, of, of changing climate conditions and intense water demands is causing more and more of this river to dry up. And the Fish and Wildlife Service is rescuing endangered cyprinids there to try to you know, reduce mortality in the face of stream drying. And so as, as more and more managers are, are you know, dealing with uh, species of concern or populations of concern in drying systems, um, I think a really you know, intuitive and, and you know, common shared response is, well, let's, let's try to rescue these fish and, and prevent you know, these major mortality events from drying. And there's, um, this is not an exhaustive list, but just here's some examples of the type of rescue efforts that are going on in, in the Pacific states and in no particular order. Uh, so for the first one is um, the one with the images pictured here. The Scott River, which is a, one of the major tributaries to the Klamath, during the severe California drought in 2013, the mainstream river got so low that, uh, that adult returning fish could not reach the tributaries where they spawned and spawned in the main stem. And so in response, the state and other folks um, transported the emergent fry from those spawning into tributary habitats. Now, a longer-term effort is that of folks in the Carmel River. I know one of the people involved with this project, Kevin, is on the phone. Kevin, thanks for your email earlier. Uh, so in the Carmel, they've had a 25-year effort that's uh, captured over 400,000 juvenile steelhead from drying reaches and either moved them to perennial, to, to reaches that weren't drying, or to captivity. And there's a recent um, empirical evaluation of this program published in PLOS One. Uh, another example from the Klamath is on the lower portion of the river um, in McCarvey Creek. It's a tributary that's real close to the ocean. The Yurok tribe is rescuing fish. Um, and one of the kind of neat uh, intersections of multiple conservation tools here is that one of the things that, um, that they're going to start exploring is whether beaver dam analogs, which can increase flow permanence, whether they might be a conservation tool for creating throughout refugia that they can use as the destination for these rescued fish. And lastly, um, we're going to be shifting gears now and, and describing um, uh, a pretty major fish rescue effort program that emerged in the 90s in the Pacific Northwest. And that's Northwest Wild Fish Rescue. All right, so this is another example of one of these grassroots programs. So this program is run by Dave Brown, who's just uh, you know, a passionate local citizen who saw his streams drying up and the fish that he cared about um, dying. And so he started this program where they began rescuing fish. And you know, Dave is, a, is an, like I was saying, he's an example of just a concerned citizen. He's, I, I'm pretty sure he's a leather salesman, so he's not a scientist. Um, and it's just a, an example of a, you know, a, a, someone who is passionate and wanted to do something about the fish they cared about. It's volunteer run, so they certainly incur costs, but it's a, a smaller budget compared to, you know, like a state hatchery or something like that. And it operates on small tributaries of the Salmon Creek and the East Fork Lewis River, which flow into the Lower Columbia. And I'll show a map in just a sec. 
So most of the fish that are rescued in this program are ESA listed juvenile coho salmon that are part of the Lower Columbia ESU, and they're collected under a 4D permit from NOAA. And these are these tributaries. Um, they drain the foothills of the of the west slope of the Cascades, so they have these rain dominated hy dominated hydrologies, and stream drying and fragmentation occurs annually. And we don't have great long term data on water quantity in these tributaries, but you know if you talk to locals or state bios who have worked there, uh, they suggest that it's gotten worse in recent decades, probably because of suburban sprawl and more wells being um, drilled and, and, and factors like that, basically increasing human water demands. So here's a map of where this rescue occurs. And so if you look at the, in the inset, you can see that this is in southern, southwest Washington. And it, these are tributaries that drain into the Columbia on the left side of your, stream, of your screen. And this is the part of Columbia where it takes that sharp bend around Portland. This is the bend in the river that, that caused the Willamette Valley to be formed in the Missoula floods, but that's a whole different story. Um, so you can see Salmon Creek and the East Fork Lewis River and all these little tributaries. And, and these, are the, these are these streams that dry up where the program works. And you might be thinking, okay, these are small rain-dominated streams um, in areas with pretty heavy land use. So why, why make these the focus of your effort why not focus on protecting more pristine habitat that might have a snow-dominated hydrology that might just be better habitat for these fish? And part of the reason is that the, some of the major habitats in this ESU that are snow-dominated are now cut off by flood control dams, so places like the Cowlitz River. And these tributaries actually represent some of the best remaining habitat, especially for the East Fork Lewis population. And they have this nice low gradient habitat that historically was some of the best habitat for coho salmon in this region. And as I mentioned earlier, here is what these habitats look like in the summer. So here's a picture of, of Brittany crawling over a cottonwood in what used to be a deep pool. And you can see there's, there's reaches that go entirely dry and there's various levels of drying. And folks that are familiar with stream drying, this won't be that surprising to you, but one of the things that really struck me um, was that when we went out at the beginning of the year and we, and we started putting some instruments in, we thought, oh, the, the pools that aren't going to dry up are going to be the really deep pools. Um, but one of the things you find out pretty quickly is that these deep pools, like the one that Brittany's pictured in, that, that are these scoured out pools that have these deep, um, that have a substrate that's cobble and gravel, they can actually be some of the first to go dry because so much of the flow can go subsurface there. Whereas these shallow pools, like the one pictured in the upper right corner, that have more of a bedrock um, substrate and it's less permeable to flows, those are actually some of the pools that were most likely to hold water. So that, that was sort of an uh, interesting um, observation uh, you know, for someone who's kind of new to the topic of stream drying. All right, so I want to really quickly walk through the Northwest Wildfish Rescue um, how they operate, and how it's different from other fish rescue programs. So Dave and volunteers go out as early as April and start collecting fish. So a key point to point out here is that they do not wait for fragmentation and drying to occur, as you can see in this picture, but they, they go out and start scooping fish as soon as they can. And then these fish are not released back into the wild, but instead are taken to a to an off-site rearing facility. And they are reared there from the point of capture until the following spring. So they're, they're not released into the wild, and they're not released at the end of the drought season, but instead the following spring. And because they're stored as a mixed stock, and for other reasons, um, they, are, they are released, they're outplanted back into the wild, but not necessarily in their natal stream. And they collect, they've collected about 150,000 juvenile fish in total, and they're dominated by coho salmon. And typically, they collect about 15 to 30,000 juvenile coho salmon per year. And as I describe these methods, um, I think you know if you're a, if you're a salmon ecologist, you might 
some red flags might go up. You know, we know that, that hatchery rearing can have negative effects on fish, and there's concerns about domestication selection. So why would you release fish back into the wild? Um, but sort of as, as a counter argument to that is that we also know that there's really strong density dependence for juvenile salmonids that rear in streams. You know, this is the reason that Chinook and coho salmon are so much less abundant than pink and chums. And so if you release rescued fish back into the wild, you're probably going to be increasing fish densities in the recipient habitats where you place those, those rescued fish. And so this could make it worse for the non-rescued fish and would likely decrease their growth and survival. Um, and this density dependence could even be exacerbated you know, during that first summer uh, we know from work, um, you know, from either experimental work or observational work, such as uh, Harvey's, and here's some of uh, Brett Harvey's experimental work showing that low flows um, can reduce foraging opportunities and growth and increase competition for juvenile salmons in streams. So adding more fish to this sort of situation could potentially not be a good thing. So the key question um, for stakeholders and managers is, you know, fish rescue clearly is good for the individuals that get rescue, or, or most, you know, it appears to be certainly if the pool they were in dries up. Um, you know, it's better for one of these fish to go into a, uh, a different habitat than into the stomach of a great blue heron. But the question is, how does this effort scale up beyond individuals to the level of population? And does it have a positive impact at the population level, which is what you know, management is more typically concerned with? So uh, the motivation for this project was that, um, that we were, we were um, you know, uh, discussing issues with uh, WDFW. And two of their scientists in the Southern Washington region, Thomas Burens and Kale Bentley, um, approached us about the, their concerns about stream drying and fish rescue. And their agency is getting increasing sort of demands to do something about drought. Washington has had some drought recently. Uh, streams are drying. ESA listed fish are dying. And they're getting increasing demands for, to do fish rescues. And they're also getting asked um, to evaluate uh, programs like Northwest Fish Rescue. So what we did is we Working with WDFW and other, um, and other groups, we have been co-developing a uh, methodology to evaluate fish rescue. And, and not only the Northwest Fish Rescue Program specifically, but also to kind of create a, a generalizable tool that people in other systems can use to kind of um, sketch out the different possible outcomes of fish rescue. And we've been working on sort of an iterative pro process of developing, you know, potential methodologies and then and, and adapting them. And what we've kind of, where we decide to go is to sort of identify the key assumptions of the fish rescue program that we were evaluating and then come up with ways that we could evaluate some of those assumptions. So one is that there's severe um, stream drying and severe contraction of habitats that make it so that that the summer life stage is probably a bottleneck to population productivity. Next, that fish survival is extremely low during the summer in these drying streams. And lastly, that fish rescue is enhancing adult returns. And the way that we're evaluating these assumptions is through a combination of empirical work um, measuring environmental and biological variables and then also some uh, life cycle modeling. And so to measure the degree of drying and habitat contraction, we're doing habitat surveys and wet-dry mapping to determine the degree to which survival is reduced over the summer. We've been surveying fish and sampling fish and, and doing mark recapture analysis. And lastly, um, you know, we don't have long-term data on adult returns in these systems. Um, so we don't have the potential to do something like um, 
like Kevin and Mark Mangle and others did in the Carmel River. And so instead what we're doing is creating an empirically parameterized life cycle model that can kind of um, create a transparent and explicit way to quantitatively explore the potential costs and benefits of this program. And so Brittany um, is a master's student funded by this project. She's been, been um, developing this uh, life cycle model in collaboration with all the other people on this project. And she's going to describe the model to you in a sec. And I'm just first, I just want to sort of coarsely describe some of the preliminary empirical results that we're seeing. And so one of the things that we thought was really interesting is that um, we did find sort of some substantial amount of habitats or stream reaches that remained wetted during the summer. Uh, for example, this beaver dam pictured here. But what was surprising is that water quantity didn't always translate into the presence of fish. So this was a really turbid beaver pond, and we, we didn't really find any coho salmon in it. And we think that, in, and so we're not sure if, if this kind of surprising lack of fish in some wetted habitats is due to them not being proximate to spawning habitats, so they're not getting seeded, or if it might be a water quality issue. For example, here maybe this uh, bioturbation is causing there to be a lot of uh, biological oxygen demand and low oxygen conditions. Okay, so second, if you look at the picture on the bottom, uh, it's not one of my greatest pictures I've ever taken, but what you can see here if you look closely is there's hundreds of juvenile coho salmon sitting motionless, sitting motionless on the bottom of this pool. So we found that, that a lot of fish did find some wetted habitats, hunker down, and survive through the summer. And so right now we're refining our mac mark recalcitrant models to, to try to narrow our confidence intervals on what the proportion of the population that survived was. And lastly, um, we, uh, we put pit tag antenna arrays at the outlets of the tributaries that we were working in, and we did not see a clear pulse of emigration before stream drying. So it's possible that some fish maybe emigrate as fry shortly after emergence, but we didn't get the sense that, um, that as the flows were declining, that fish were leaving the system and finding drought refugia elsewhere. Okay, and so with that, I'm going to um, hand the slides over to Brittany, and she's going to describe our life cycle modeling effort. All right. So with that, uh, I'd like to transition uh, to the model by first discussing our objectives. Um, a goal of our model, oops, excuse me. A goal of our model is to explore the costs and benefits of fish rescue and how these cost-benefit trade-offs might differ with various rescue levels and drought conditions. One particular trade-off that we're interested in exploring is the potential for captivity to influence survival in subsequent life stages. Benefits of fish rescue might be captured through increased adult returns or perhaps decreased probability of reaching some extinction threshold. Costs of fish rescue, on the other hand, may be seen through reduced survival in life stages following captivity, perhaps as a consequence of domestication, uh, or seen as increased spawner strain. The ratio of non-rescued spawners returning compared to rescue spawner returns might reveal the impact of fish rescue. Lastly, it's important to note that costs may also be economic. Since our model is based on the salmon life cycle, I wanted to just briefly discuss what this model looks like for coho. Compared to other salmonid species, there isn't much life history diversity within our, within our system. Coho generally smolts as age one, spend two summers in the ocean, and then return as age three spawners. Uh, jacks, or age two spawners, do occur, but uh, this number is presumed to be small, and thus we don't include it in our model. If we take a look at the timing of freshwater uh, life history events overlaid on a hydrograph, uh, this one is of the East Fork Lewis River um, near our study site, we see that spawning occurs uh, in November to January. Eggs incubate until spring when they begin to emerge, and juveniles then rear for approximately a year before migrating out um, the following spring or early summer. The time period of particular interest to us is during the rearing phase, uh, which spans minimal to no flow conditions in the summer to maximum flow in the winter. As you can imagine, 
uh, very different habitat is available throughout the duration of this rearing phase. Uh, about half of the rearing phase encompasses dry summer months. Uh, this is a potential time for fish to put on weight, as larger body size is often linked to higher survival rates. Uh, but during our field surveys that we did in the summer of 2017, we saw many fish with no growth, uh, and some that actually lost weight during this time. I also wanted to uh, point out that the timing of this rearing phase coincides almost precisely uh, with the timing of fish rescue. So uh, if we remember, fish uh, are captured in early summer and then released the following spring. Keeping this in mind, uh, I'd like to move on to the conceptual model. Uh, first, the salmon life cycle serves as the framework for our model. The spawners, fry, par, smolt, and adult life stages uh, which you can see as the white boxes here, represent our state variables, with both fry and adults broken down further into rescued and non-rescued fish. Uh, the red arrows, then, uh, are representing our state transitions or survival from one state variable to the next. Fish rescue uh, is included in the model through an inner pathway with captivity survival represented as the arrow from rescued fry to smolt. This state transition also represents a potential benefit of fish rescue uh, as survival uh, from time of capture as a fry to time of release as a smolt is much higher than that for non-rescued fish. For example, uh, with the Northwest Wild Fish Rescue, um, they state that their program has achieved a survival rate greater than 90%, uh, which is consistent with what we see in uh, hatcheries. Um, I'd also like to point out that the captivity survival encompasses the same time frame as both the summer and winter survival for non-rescued fish. So in other words, captivity bypasses the entire freshwater rearing phase. Uh, the arrow between uh, rescued smolts and adults then uh, represents survival from ocean migration through a year of ocean residency. This arrow also represents a cost of fish rescue. Having been raised in captivity, uh, rescued fish are likely ill-adapted to the natural environment and thus experience lower post-release survival. Another potential cost of fish rescue may occur as uh, a loss of returning spawners due to straying. Um, although, we aren't, or, although we are aware of this, it's not currently within the scope of our model. Uh, moving on then, all freshwater survivals are limited by suitable habitat availability. For spawning, this availability um, is of suitable spawning locations. Uh, for summer, uh, habitat capacity is influenced by water availability. And lastly, winter survival is limited by the amount of high flow refuge, which is also linked to stream flow hydrology. In the marine environment, uh, ocean conditions influence all three marine related survivals, uh, but not necessarily equally. For example, uh, post-release survival of hatchery fish has been seen to decrease by up to five times compared to that of wild fish. Uh, we plan to explore these varying differences in survival with simulations ranging from equal survival between the non-rescued and rescued fish um, up to this five-fold uh, difference. Uh, moving back to the freshwater side of the life cycle, I wanted to point out that drought severity in our model is controlled by adjusting summer habitat capacity. With more severe droughts represented by a lower capacity and less severe droughts by a higher capacity. We plan to simulate the population over a range of habitat capacity levels. Uh, summer conditions may also impact subsequent winter survival. It is expected that fish in poor body condition as a consequence of harsh drought conditions during the summer will likely have lower winter survival than those in better condition. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we saw uh, many fish with no growth and some that actually lost weight during our field season. And it's expected that these fish with poor body condition at the end of summer will have a lower winter survival. So how do we begin to model our coho population? Well, um, our modeling approach follows the general uh, methodology of Mousseli and Hilborn which uses this sequential beverton holt function. Uh, as you can see below, this function uh, can be rewritten to solve for survival, uh, which is the metric of our state transitions. Uh, this me methodology 
has been widely used in various modeling efforts. Uh, one you folks might be familiar with is the Shiraz model, published by Shirell et al. in 2006. Um, but more recently, Olberger et al. adapted this approach to explore the effects of, low, uh, of flow on coho population dynamics. We use the sequential Beverton Holt methodology for all of our freshwater state transitions. Uh, we assume these transitions are density dependent and include egg to fry survival, which again is limited by spawning capacity, summer survival of non-rescued fry to par, and winter survival from non-rescued par to smolt. For the, <coughs> for the remaining uh, state transitions, we assume density independent. These survival rates are drawn from beta distribution based on values obtained from the literature. These density independent transitions include captivity survival, which is the transition from rescued fry to smolt, as well as the marine state transitions from smolt to adult of both rescued and non-rescued fish, and also uh, from adult back up to spawner. Simulations uh, will be run using various fish rescue levels. Uh, while Northwest Wild Fish Rescue typically rescues between 15,000 and 32,000 fish, uh, additional rescue levels will be modeled, including simulations with no rescue uh, to simulations with total or complete rescue. Each simulation spans 99 years, or uh, 33 generations if you consider the typical coho three-year life cycle, and 1,000 simulations will be run for each parameter combination. Particular combinations we're interested in modeling are various levels of rescue, drought severity, which again is represented by altering summer habitat capacity, and also differences in smolt to adult survival between rescued and non-rescued fish. We're currently refining our preliminary model and exploring uh, our model sensitivities, so we're not quite ready to share our results with you just yet. Um, while we will be exploring a wide range of parameter values, our final model results will be tailored specifically to our system and uh, the Northwest Wild Fish Rescue Program. With this information, we will evaluate the effectiveness of this program and have a better understanding of how the costs and benefits vary as a function of rescue level and habitat conditions. With our model results, we will develop an interactive web application that allows users to explore the model in a way that doesn't require a sophisticated background skill set. The R Shiny application developed by Sancho et al. Um, at WDFMW is pictured here. It contains slide bars to customize the model to various conditions. And this is exactly what we're aiming to create for our own model. And it's our hope that managers across the Pacific Northwest might be able to use this web interface, interface to explore the implications for fish rescue in their own systems. And with that, uh, we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, folks, uh, uh, so while you guys are typing away and punching in questions or thinking about questions, we do have a, a quick note from uh, Frank Emerson, uh, just noting that the, uh, the volunteer rescues on the Carmel River uh, predate that history. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, we do have a question from Jimmy Faulkner. I hope I said that right. Uh, what method do you use to calculate K equals total habitat capacity? Hey, Jimmy, thanks for the question. Um, so in, in our system, we are using the data from our fish sampling and our mark recapture and our wet dry mapping to, to sort of relate uh, habitat area and the extent of drying to fish capacity. And so and the methods will probably vary depending on the area and what data you have. So, if, for example, if you were doing this in the, in the context outside of drought, you might use relationships between stream length and rearing capacity um, to, set, to set that value. Um, but I believe in your data, you, or in your system, you guys have some um, information on survival and rearing capacity, so I, I would think that you could put that in there. And, and just to be clear, K is the is total habitat capacity in the number of individuals. Thank you, Johnny. 
we do have a question from Shari. Uh, how does fish rescue work to find a long-term solution? Are you advocating this as a short-term Band-Aid while improving summer rearing habitat? That's, that's a really great question. And um, uh, to be clear, you know, we're not advocating for this program. You know, we were approached to help them evaluate it, so we're not trying to tell them you should do this or you shouldn't. Um, but I think where someone, so the nice thing about these models is that they can basically provide a quantitative hypothesis. So if you're an advocate of fish rescue, you can show transparently and quantitatively why you think it's a good idea. Or if, you, if you're suspicious of it and, you, and, and, you know, and, and you're concerned that it's, that it's you know, not a long-term solution, you could also make those arguments with the model. And, and here's an example of how you might make an argument from both sides. So if in your system, sort of, um, if there's really extreme drying and you have a small population size and maybe there's low marine survival, you might be able to show with this model that there's high risk of population extirpation if you don't have some level of, of intervention. Whereas if you were in a, a system that had, that had you know, higher over summer survival or maybe higher marine survival, um, you, know, you might be able to show that the, the population is viable without this intervention, and you could show that um, perhaps that, that the second you stop the intervention, the population goes back to normal. Um, so those are, those are the ways in, in which this tool um, is hopefully an obj sort of an objective tool that people can use to kind of assess alternative hypotheses about the uh, effectiveness of fish rescue. So we have a question from Bobby Flores. Uh, when do you expect to have your analysis completed and available? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, we will have our product available um, before March of 2019. And so, you know, we're currently, um, that's the great thing about these short projects, you know. Half the time I feel like when I ask someone how their simulation model is going, the answer is always that we're not done yet. But this is a finite project, and we're a good way through developing the simulation model, and, um, and we're going to have it, uh, our Shiny app available March 2019. Okay, and another uh, note from uh, Shari. Uh, in the Scott River, we saw there was no improved survival by rescuing fish. I believe that fish could use environmental clues. Cues to find cold water habitat and even survival in isolated pools. How do you know when rescuing fish that they would survive by means not obvious to the observer? So, so that's a great question. And um, so what, you know, I think our approach to it was, um, was the empirical work that we did by tracking the survival of individuals in in fragmented pools, and also by having our pit tag array where we could see if fish were emigrating and, for example, moving out to the East Fork Lewis. Um, so that's how we, that's how, that was our approach. Um, and, and maybe just to talk about how other folks have, you know, other folks have done stuff similar. So, for example, if you look at Jason Juan and Stephanie Carlson's recent work, they, um, they basically had pit tagged individuals in fragmented pools. And they went back, you know, at routine intervals throughout the summer and scanned those pools for those pit tags. And, um, you know, what they found is that the results can vary by pool and, and, and among years depending on winter precip. Um, but in, in some years, you know, there is really high mortality, especially towards the end of the summer. Okay. And uh, we have a question from Neil. Uh, first, it says, great talk. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, do you have any idea the level of genetic diversity coming into the rescue program? I'm wondering if the sampling is highly clustered, you may be getting a number of siblings in the captive rearing part of the program and essentially be operating as a quasi-hatchery program. So, so that's a great question, Neil. And um, so, they, you know, this is a grassroots program. And so they have a bunch of, there's a bunch of hatchery-like tanks in a backyard and I can assure you that there's not a barn with a PCR machine in it next to it. So, you know, there isn't, um, there aren't formal estimates of, of you know, it's, this is not something like, uh, you know, like uh, 
like the fancy hatcheries on the Klamath River where they're looking at you know relatedness and things like that. And so I think this is um, you know a potential concern. I was just rereading some of the um, work from the Hood River out of Michael Bluen's lab on this stuff, and we are kind of thinking about um, how do you how would you incorporate into this model you know potential effects of domestication beyond uh, subsequent survival within a generation. For, you know, for example, um, some prior work showing that the number of generations in captivity causes uh, you know, exponential decline in fitness. And we're, we're trying to figure if you could find a way to get that into this model to explore some of those assumptions without this having to be you know, an individual-based genetics model that will just become intractable. So I think that is a really important question because in, you know, some of these programs are essentially uh, mini hatcheries. And you know, from work like Carl Schreck's lab at OSU um, and other folks have found that you know, when fish are reared in simple environments, they have different phenotypes. Um, they can be really different fish. And um, so yeah, th that's a concern. And we don't, we don't have a, a clear answer at this time. OK, looks like we have one more question. Uh, Sean says, are you folks interested in investigating sorry, the genetic effects of fish rescue? So I think that was kind of. Uh, feeding off of that. Um, yeah, and, and kind of follow up on, on, on Neil's question. I think this is a really important issue. Um, and we're, us individually are not interested. I tried to do a population genetic study for my senior thesis at Lewis and Clark, and I could never amplify my microsatellites. So it certainly won't be me that's doing it. But I think as, this tech, as there's increasing demands for this technique, it clearly has, um, you know, similarities and differences than traditional hatchery rearing, and it's clearly having, um, you know, probably has some effect on the genetics of fish, so it's certainly a really, if this technique is expanded, I think it's going to be a really important uh, topic to understand, yeah, what is there domestication selection, and what are the techniques? All right, excellent. So I think that's all we've got for today for questions. Uh, I... Um, once again, I want to thank everyone who participated. I want to especially give a thank, thank you to uh, Johnny and Brittany for your presentation and uh, also to USGS for your continued support of this webinar series. Thank you very much.